Yes, a set of fire in you. <laughs> That's yeah. what happened. Seven tips on how to make a good first impression on the job. All right, so here today I have Sam. She is 24 years old, grad student at Cornell University who makes videos covering modern dating on YouTube as a side hobby. So I'll have her channel link down below in the description. So make sure to check her out. I swear at this, I didn't mean to not allow her to say hi. So go ahead and say <laughs> hi. <laughs> oh, hi guys. I'm so, I'm really excited to be on this channel and I'm so happy that I stumbled upon your channel and that we were able to collab on this. Yes. Yes. It's great. Number one, humble yourself. The YMCA in my early twenties, a new manager came in and at this point I worked there for two years and there was just managers coming in and out. So this new manager came in and I was defensive because I was thinking this is another manager who doesn't know what they're doing. And he came in and instead of trying to take control of everything and telling me and everybody else what to do, which I was used to the other managers doing who didn't work out, he came in very humble and very much so a open mindset, learner mindset and asked me, pulled me in and other people in and said, hey, what's going on, what's not working for you, what is working for you, what would you ideally like? And he was asking me all of these questions that really addressed all of my concerns, what, how I think things are now, how I think they can be better. And with that, we formulated a plan together and he did that for everybody. And from that, I just felt, wow, I really respect what he did, number one, but also there's an instant rapport built because you didn't come in there thinking I need to be an authoritative leader, which I think is wrong versus like a servant oriented leader, which is I'm here to serve you. And uh, that was the first time I, I had somebody who, who came in that was that could have gone the total opposite way. But he came in very humble and everybody listened to him because of that. And it was just a great experience to have. So I haven't had experience where I had like someone new coming into the situation, but I've had situations where someone on the CEO position and the CEO, COO position, they were very humble themselves. So like they really honored my opinion and I came in as like entry level, right? And so I was just like, you know, I was doing a run of the mill type of job. So I didn't really see myself as significant, but they really valued my opinion. They even had like one-on-ones with me like every other week with CEO and with the COO. And I really value that because I saw that they really truly do care about my own opinion. They wanted this transparency between both people who are at a lower level and someone at a higher level. Just because like when you're in the higher level, there's some things you just can't see and there's really nothing you can do about it just because you're dealing with totally different situations. And people who are at the lower level, they're doing kind of dealing more of the day to day and they kind of see problems when they are arising. Um, it's really up to the people at the lower level to try to fix those problems. But the people at the higher level, they sometimes they don't even know that there were problems to begin with. So because they kind of like built that environment where you're allowed to like share the problems and you're allowed to share with upper management and you didn't really have to get through multiple people um, in order to really um, share your opinion, I really found myself valued as a company. So I, um, I would say that humbling yourself, no matter what position you're in, that really will make create a really great dynamic, especially for the work environment. They mm -hmm. came to you and, and they asked you, hey, what's going on? And they valued your opinion. What did that do for you on a tangible level? Did you stay at the company longer than you would have otherwise? Or what was the tangible result from that? I stayed at the company and I'm still with the company right now. So I'm working, I'm still working with them right now. And yeah, so in the beginning I came in as the ex, like the expert in like what the position they kind of um, put me in. And because of that, they saw that I was really good at that role and they saw that I had potential and they saw, and then with that, I was able to move to a different role that I was more interested in. And while I did, was able still to, um, I was able to still do the daily task for the original role I was given, but they kind of saw, had confidence in me in order um, to do another role, just because we did have that rapport. We did have that one-to-one -one every other week and they really saw potential. So they were confident, even though I went deep dive into something I totally did not have any experience in, they had confidence that I could really learn on my own and here I'm still with them today. That's so great. Uh, and, and I love that you said the rapport was built because coming in, it's, it's hard to build rapport when somebody's coming in trying to push their own agenda on you, regardless of what you want, may or may not want, versus somebody who's coming in and they're basically putting their hand out and saying, 
What is, what is your opinion? What do you think? What is your potential? I think middle management is one of the hardest because you have to please the, the people above you. And then you also have to make sure your team is at it and working efficiently. And then you also have to be, on one hand, you need results. And on the other hand, making sure that the team is for each other instead of trying to backstab each other, which can happen very easily in corporate environment environments. But if you come in humble on both ends, whether it's the people above you or uh, below you, I hate saying that, but people who are, you know, in your responsibility, then there's no, there's no losing that. Gain respect ASAP. How do we do that? How do we do that? Uh, I I think extreme ownership is huge. If you haven't read that book yet, I don't know Sam if you know extreme ownership. No, book. I haven't. No. But just taking ownership essentially when things go wrong, and uh, if there's a failure, and even if it's not entirely your fault, because oftentimes nothing's black and white. There's a lot of gray area, but. The more you can take ownership when something goes wrong, a lot of people, especially if you're new, people just respect you a lot better because they also feel like they can trust you. And trust is huge because if people feel like they can trust you on a team you work on, then when something goes away, as the more you have their back, the more likelihood that they'll have your back. And you'll just either rise, make the team better, build a lot of rapport and people are going to be rooting for you that you definitely want people to be rooting for you instead of trying to figure out ways to backstab you in any type of way so on one hand it's defense and on the other hand it's being proactive about making sure that you are a valuable member of the team and an easy way to do that is just take ownership when things go wrong and take ownership on what you've contributed to that project or incident or event yeah, on the flip side, also not uh, not only just taking ownership of your mistakes, but also take ownership of the things you do well. I tend to be the type of person who will either like lessen what I've done for the company or just lessen you know, my role. But if you've done something, actually like be confident about it and really, um, you shouldn't really hide your accomplishments. You really should like decrease yourself in order to make someone else feel better. Because I, I know I used to have that bad habit. So now whenever I do something, I take full ownership of it. I'm like, yes, I did that project. Yes, I was able to meet X, Y, and Z goal. And so with that, like not only taking ownership of the mistakes you made, but also making sure to take ownership of any accomplishments you have made like at the company. Yeah. Yes. First impressions. Uh, first impressions, as you know, is very key. I wanted to touch on two things because th one of it is nowadays social media because that is very prevalent a lot of employers and even teammates that hear your name they actually google you i know i've done it myself so <laughs> i know this is a thing where they google you they look you up and your social media profile facebook instagram twitter doesn't matter what it is they're going to look you up and see what you've done even linkedin especially linkedin is really huge right now they want to see your work history what you've done in the past do people review you is your profile picture professional or are you drinking a can of beer and all of that matters because that's going to be oftentimes your virtual first impression with somebody and they're going to have a bunch of assumptions good or bad because of your social media presence so if that's not cleaned up already i would make sure to clean it up or set it on private if possible on the other hand i talk about first impressions body language tonality that's that's what i talk about so if you haven't checked out my open body language first impressions i'll leave that link down below in the description so you can check it out and improve your first impression body language so with first impressions i definitely think it's key like in, in all my past internships i've always made the effort to say hi to everyone even if they weren't directly working on my team just because maybe somewhere down the line, I will have to ask a favor. And that's actually coming so, so handy. Like yeah. uh, there, I've reached out back to people that I've worked at maybe two or three years ago, just because I know they can connect me to someone else that I would need. And because I already built that relationship, even if they weren't on my team, I just built that relationship because I wanted to set that really good impression. I've been able to use their resources to benefit me. Cross departmental first impressions, saying hello, just like what you said. There are so many people who are like you, Sam, who started in one department and then they shifted to another department. And there's a lot of times in companies uh, or teams, or even if you're building your own business, 
the departments try to compete against each other. They feel like, oh, our department's better than your department or something like that. And if you get into that hype, uh, what happens is that this happens and you never know what might happen. You never know what person might shift over. And because of that, you just want to make sure you cover all your bases. I, I love that you said that it's, it doesn't matter if you don't even work with them. I found that those people actually root for you even more. And psychologically, people who are not very close to you or who have worked closely to you or a close friend of you, but people who are acquaintances and distant, you kind of know them, but you know of them, but you don't really know them too much. Those people are more likely to recommend you to their network, their off network, and it becomes this whole web. So it's very interesting. It's actually very good to have acquaintances, professionally speaking, more than it is to be uh, chummy chummy with just the people you work very, very closely with. So if you want to expand your network, that's how you do it is build a crap ton of acquaintances and be on very good terms with them. Tip number four, who runs what? This is more of an office politics mindset. Uh, number one, if you don't know the organizational charts and who has what position, very good to know. Ask for the organizational charts. Usually they give it to you, but if they haven't, then just ask for it. Just sometimes they just don't give you the organizational chart and you really have to figure it out on your own. So that's where I would actually go and use LinkedIn as my resource and figure out, okay, what position do they have? Memorize who has what position, who's above who, who's in management under or below who, and all of that is going to go and play. And you know how to talk to each individual because that's going to matter so much. And emails and one-on-one -on -one communication, when you're requesting things, you know who to go to for what. And the reason why that's super important is because you want to know who's on your level. So like, and then who's like higher up, right? So if you do have a problem, sometimes you don't really want to sound an alarm right away to someone who's like higher level. And maybe you want to talk to someone who's more on your level and you can work it out together. So you just have to be cognizant of how you address certain issues or problems and how you address it with someone who's your equal versus someone who's maybe higher management, totally different. And you can get a very different outcome. Um, so I would say that's super important and you should definitely memorize the organizational chart, even in a social setting. So there are even happy hours. Right, so you have happy hours with your company. You have you should know the names of every single person in the, in that place. At least recognize their face. And you should also, um, with happy hours, you should kind of also know how to address someone who's higher up versus someone who's equal. Right. So you just really have to. Um, it's just really important to know that organizational chart, just because you want to set the correct impression to the right people. What's an example of that of addressing somebody who's your level or somebody higher level? At least within the companies I've worked with, the the way I would talk to someone to a more level, you would use a chat function within the email versus someone who's a higher level, you would like have a perfectly worded email, right? So with someone at a higher level, I am more careful trying to get to the point, trying to make sure I don't add any like um, words that, or just being careful what I write in the email versus someone who's more on my level. Yeah, yeah. typically said. I, I actually used to have a problem when I went into management is, I, because I want to be friends with everybody and if you're this type of person where you just want to be chill with everybody there is a hierarchy that you do have to honor and you want to for it to be honored so when people were uh, under my team and under my supervision I wanted to buddy buddy up with them but then somebody uh, the higher level person said hey Tina you shouldn't do that just simply because they're going to view you as somebody at your level and they may not respect you when you, you need a deadline to be done or there's a project coming up that just needs to, you know, especially when you're doing project management of any type, just be friendly and all of that. But there's a certain level where I never really talk about my personal life um, too much or, you know, things of that nature, as opposed to somebody who's at my level or even above me. Um, if they were to ask above me, then I would say a little bit more about my personal life or what happened in the weekend uh, or somebody who's on my same level, I would definitely talk to them. So just being aware of that. And as you move in the organizational charts to always constantly be aware of like who's moving, where and what, because all of that is gonna matter. Building report across the board. In the last company, I was a product developer. Product development, there are many parts to it. So you have the marketing department, you have operations, you have finance. There's many different people that touch that single product. 
I was in the research and development, so I personally made that product. But with that, you have to leverage like everyone on a team. Every project is very cross-functional. With that, I knew that the procurement team had like a bad rep and you had to really be buddy-buddy with them in order to get anything done. Otherwise, they'll put your project at the bottom of the list. So right going right in, I knew I had to be like extra friendly, right? Because I had to plant those seeds and making sure that they saw me as like someone's friendly, that they liked me. So in order to get things done. And this is not, people may see it as like manipulative, but it's kind of more of a way to, uh, I would say it, you just really have to know how to navigate different people because you're going to encounter different people in your lifetime and you just really have to see how they work and if you recognize that um, a certain department needs a different type of interaction than another department, you really have to cater to them in order to make sure that your projects get complete. Mm -hmm. um, so that summer, I became best friends with procurement and also it became best friends with marketing because marketing, they cut them, marketing and R&D, they tend to have like a very like, hostile type of relationship just because marketing wants to you know get, you know they want to claim all these million things and put a million of these into like your product because you know they, they can yeah. make all these like a like, list of claims but i'm just like that's not feasible if you want this product to taste good or like if you want to throw xyz i'm like that and then so with that you also have to balance like the finance people they're like that's way too expensive but then marketing is just like wait but that will look good on packaging so like there, you just have to really know how to navigate all these different teams just because no matter what company you're in, there's no way that you're only going to be solely working on that team. You have to really build rapport across the board in order to move that project forward. So that's, um, so the, during that, while I was at the company, I really learned that building rapport and making at least you have one friend on every single team, that will help get your project done. Yeah. Yes, yes. And especially if that one friend is a very influential friend in that team. Definitely. It's funny because you mentioned the different cross departmental and the marketing person, because I worked in marketing, where they, they want to meet their quota and every department has a quota. Every department has some KPIs they have to hit, key performance indicators for those of you who don't know. And so because of that, everybody's trying to push their own agenda. And so the only way you can get everybody together is through the social means, is through talking it out, through making sure this person's satisfied. Okay, let me bring this over to this. And that's a hard job. It's so hard. <laughs> so I condemn you, Sam, for going through that because I know how it is. It's a lot. It's a lot. Identify what your strengths and weaknesses are. So coming into the company that I currently work for, I came in as a food safety specialist just because that's what I'm currently studying at Cornell. So I did have that knowledge and that's exactly why they brought me on because no one else on that team had that knowledge. So I came in and I re completely rebuilt the system, their quality system, and I had like documentation and that was something I was really confident in. But that being said, just because I'm confident in something doesn't mean I, w I don't want to learn more, right? So I knew I was really good at this one thing, but I saw what operations was doing. I saw what marketing was doing. And then like, I was like, wait, I really want to touch those departments. Like, yes, I had not never been in the operations department or in marketing department. So I probably didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but I would attend their project meetings. So I realized that, yes, that's a weakness of mine. I don't really know what's going on in other parts of the company, but I really want to build it up. So what I started doing is I always, I would attend every single meeting, even though it would, wasn't directly related to me, I was like, I want to get to know more of it. So then I was choosing between operations and marketing. And as I attended more and more marketing meetings, I realized, wait, this is something I really enjoy doing. So even right now, I've become like the marketing associate um, at the company, just because like I, I express interest in, in it. And I realized that was a weakness of mine, but I was willing to work on that weakness by even on my own time, I will read marketing materials, I will read books, I will find other resources to really, um, you know, fill in the gaps of my knowledge that, because I've taken some marketing classes as an undergrad, but that wasn't enough for the companies. And I really knew that was like, you know, uh, a barrier of mine. And because of that, I just took the extra stuff needed to really make that weakness less of an insecurity. And now I could confidently say that I could probably run, not fully run, but I could be on a marketing team. Even though I, I come from a traditional science background, I have the confidence to say I will do. I will thrive in a marketing team just because I realized it was a weakness and I took the steps necessary to make it more of a strength. Yeah. Can, can I just say because I spoke about this in one of my video about confidence specifically and increasing our confidence. You can check that video out below in the description. But Sam, for you, you talked about I wasn't confident in marketing. 
but you are confident in Sam that she can go out and learn more and be more. And I think that those are two different distinctions is that you could be not confident in a certain task, in a certain thing that because you've never done it or you haven't done it enough. But that can be learned, you can grow, and having enough confidence in yourself to say, I can learn, but because you have that mantra of, I know I can learn, I know I can grow, I know I can do more than what I'm doing right now, that base level of self-confidence, that's what brings you to be able to attend the market. Because I bet you more than anything, there's other people in the company where they, they're thinking, oh, I might be interested, I might be interested, but they're not confident in themselves enough to say, hey, can I even attend? Can I even do a little bit more than what I'm doing right now? And that's the self-confidence. So I think with anything, it starts with self-confidence in order to just get you right there, just enough, so you can be task-oriented confidence in a specific thing and for you as marketing. So I think that was just, brilliant it's great because now you learn something new and you can keep doing that and i bet you you will you'll keep learning more thriving more growing more because you already have that base level of confidence in yourself that you can do more and also just adding on to that this was like last semester there was a recruiter i was trying to um get an internship with his marketing role he had no confidence in me he was looking at my resume and he was like you have the you have your a lot of your background experience has been more sciencey more technical and he had absolutely no confidence he's like you can't do this job I'm like, excuse me, I, that kind of added fuel to the fire. I, was, I can totally do that job and I can do it even better. So now that, so that really, that's what kind of jet set me to like going down this marketing ring. I was like, I could totally do this. So I read everything. Cause like, if you have, you, anyone can do any job they set their mind to. And you shouldn't let someone's opinion of you just their first impression, my resume. Yes, it highlights a lot of the accomplishments I've done in the past, but doesn't really show showcase who I am as a person. You don't see that I had that drive, that drive to learn. So I, from with that, I just took that negative thought. I was like, no, I can totally do better. And now I am running the marketing team at the company I'm working for. So he just lost the opportunity to have me as an intern. So yeah. Yes, a set of fire in you. <laughs> That's yeah. what happened. Yeah. Sometimes somebody telling you that you you are not it, you can't be this and that. Mm -hmm. That's that's the thing that sets you exactly. on fire to go. Uh, you know what? You don't know me like that. I can exactly. do this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> great. Tip number seven is know your worth. I can't emphasize that enough just because I know in the past, and I still do currently face this, but I have imposter syndrome. Uh, I'm sure many people do too, but there are times where- Can I'm you explain like, what imposter syndrome is for a second? Yes. So imposter syndrome is, for those who are not aware, it's when you think you're not cut out for a job or you thought you were accidentally hired and it was just a luck or by chance. So I experienced that multiple times throughout my life. Sometimes uh, it was for, when I first got to grad school, I was like, how that? heck did I get into grad school? I did not think I was qualified enough. I was like, I am not smart enough just because I was looking at all the other um, accom accomplished people in other labs and like, there's no way I can compete with that. When I first started grad school, I would say I was the least confident. But now, as I learn more and more, I, I've i come to realize that I was, I was admitted for a reason. I do have the skills necessary to succeed. I am smart enough to succeed. I do belong in this program. And while there are some um, situations where luck does play a factor but skills also is another part of it you can have all the luck in the world but if you don't have the skill set to back it up that luck doesn't really matter in the very beginning i know i was not producing the best work i could be producing just because i didn't think i had it in me to do great work but now because i've become more and more confident in myself and knowing that i have value to bring to this project I am producing great work and it really shows um, the, the, there's a stark difference between when I first started grad school and where I am today. Yes, and to your imposter syndrome, I also feel like imposter syndrome is when you're stepping outside of your comfort zone because it's something that you haven't done yet. And so you feel uncomfortable. So you feel like you're an imposter because, well, I have never done it before. It's not part of my history. It's not part of my past. I don't know it i haven't experienced it and therefore i must be an imposter but in reality that's just you being a little bit uncomfortable because you're growing because you're not in your comfort zone anymore and that's a very good thing and with that with growth 
we have to expect that we're going to fail and we're not going to always be perfect and that, that other people have the same thing that they failed themselves too and they're not perfect either and so just having that expectation management of people and of, of ourselves of uh, of allowing ourselves to fail and allowing ourselves to move forward and keep growing. And then Sam, it's you are, hey, I'm better than what I used to be. And that's why you probably don't feel the imposter syndrome anymore is because you've grown and now it's part of your comfort zone, right? So it's, you're, you're already in it. Yeah, piggybacking off of that, like setting expectations is so, so important. I came in thinking I could do X, Y, Z in like a very short period of time. And I didn't really like set realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. And that's where like someone came in and told me life is a marathon, not a sprint. Because I was trying to sprint through grad school. I was like, yes, I can complete the project in six months. And they're like, Sam, this is a project projected for like three years. What are you trying to do? Right? So I came in thinking I could do go above and beyond. And because I set such high expectations, that's why that imposter syndrome just kept on coming, like raining my thoughts. And it can be very debilitating debilitating if you don't learn to manage your expectations learning how to like manage your imposter syndrome find ways to really cope with that and then you could and once you deal with that you could find that you'll do really great work and that's really important yeah once again if you want to check out sam over at her channel i have her channel in the description below so check it out and i will see you on the next video